being recorded today, so I have to wait for the technology to be ready. So after the um, presentation, Elizabeth is going to make the video available through the CoMotion website, and the slides will be available. So you don't have to take copious notes. Um, they're not available right now because they're redoing the website, but shortly there will be links and all of the, the slides will be available. Okay, we're good to go. So thank you everyone for coming here today. Um, for our 10 minutes of Startup Friday, we are thrilled to have Catherine Meyer. She is our expert when it comes to marketing. So she has helped out many nights of our team in co-motion. Um, we have a fun night from here to see the awesome team and really help them understand marketing. So we are thrilled to have Catherine here today. Um, so without further ado, let's have Catherine uh, go. So thank you so much. Great. Glad to be here. Um, so I've run uh, my own marketing consulting business for the past 15 years, focused primarily on uh, startups and small businesses in technology and um, in particular in solar and semiconductor spaces is my area of expertise. My undergraduate degree is in chemistry, MBA in marketing and finance. Um, prior to starting my own business, I worked um, in consumer product brand management at the Clorox Company and Procter & Gamble. I also worked at Bank of America in financial marketing and then uh, spent most of my productive years in corporations with Hewlett Packard, working both in semiconductors but also helping grow their early inkjet business um, and the uh, desk jet and printer supplies businesses. So I've had a broad range of experience of across a whole lot of different marketing challenges and I'm going to try and encapsulate the best of my knowledge for you in 20 minutes. Real, a real challenge, but a fun one. So marketing, contrary to popular belief, is not sales. And marketing is not hucksterism, or as my colleagues in HP used to call us, marketeers. Um, marketing is fundamentally looking for the win-win. And I really want to emphasize that, because as you think about marketing, and you think about marketing for your startup, for your innovation, for your product, for your idea that you're going to either have now, or in the future, I want you to think about it as finding the win-win because it's all about discovering, fulfilling, and communicating to cu your customer needs. And it's all about understanding that customer and having the insight in to what problems they're trying to solve because without that insight, you're never going to have longevity and um, uh, mutual satisfaction. So you're matching your skills and offering to the problem the customer's trying to solve You've got to be speaking to the customer in a way that touches his motivations and interests. And that's where a lot of the art of marketing is advertising, is how do you speak to a, the customer in a way that motivates them. But it's also a lot of logistics, delivering the right pr product to the right person at the right price in the right place. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff about aligned incentives, but we won't go into that because that's advanced. Um, Marketing planning a visual approach. I've developed this framework over the past 10 years as I've worked with startups to try and give um, them a feel for the core elements of marketing and how it all fits together. It's a, a systematic approach. It always starts with the customer and then you're looking at your strategy piece. And I always encourage um, startup businesses to spend a lot of time on their company strategy. Do they understand who their competitors are, what the market trends are, who the channels are, channels being who delivers your product or service to the customer if it's not a direct delivery, who your different customer segments are, what your branding needs to look like, and then specifically targeting based on your competency, skills, and your understanding of the customer, what is your target product and service. So that's the strategy piece, and you spend a lot of time, and I'll go deeper into the strategy piece. Then we think about marketing core, and that is what is your pricing, your value proposition or positioning, and your messaging and communications. So once you've got your strategy nailed, then you're starting to think about how am I going to deliver this in a way that makes sense, marketing core. And then you've got your execution phase. This is how you execute on everything you plan, what are your unit and dollar forecasts? What's your marketing budget? How, what's your staffing, timing and seasonality, implementation plans? You've got your go-to-market and execution. You're measuring results and you're going right back up to the customer again and seeing whether you've done it well. You're replanning and you're doing this on a regular cycle. 
it's not a one-time thing. It's constantly looking for feedback loops. And you can draw this in a lot more complex way, but this is a really useful construct. And so as you think about doing marketing, if you're going to take on a project, um, a new company, um, come back to this slide and really work on all of the pieces and understand where you are. So starting with your customers, target markets. You're going to have many over time if you're a company because you're not going to want to be a one product, one hit wonder. Um, that's not satisfying to most of us. But your target markets need to be definable. You have to be able to speak to not just anyone who has a need for X, Y, Z, but you want it so the group is homogenous in its needs for its key attributes. And in particular, from an engineering perspective, and many of you coming from uh, an engineering and technical perspective, one way to really get into that is to think about the prototypical use case. Who is the customer who's going to use this in this way, in this environment? So example, medical devices. Um, in, in a lot of the incubator opportunities, um, they'll talk about a physical therapy device or some aid to physical therapy that someone has developed here within the UW. And they will talk about its use, but they don't differentiate its use in a hospital setting versus an outpatient physical therapy setting. But those are two, or a home setting. But those three are very different use cases. And what you're going to build around the core technology as a solution for the patient is going to be quite different. How you're going to message and communicate it is going to be very different. And so thinking about specifically going into your use case is going to give you insights into the differences between your target markets. I always encourage you, not only can they be identifiable in that you can deliver your message separately between one target market and another, but can you measure them? Do you know how many they are, where they are, and where the growth opportunities are? A great useful tool, um, and this has come up so often in my conversations with UW startups, is thinking about their initial target. What they find is, especially if you're in early phase technology, you have more market opportunity than you know what to do with. There's so many different ways you can take a core technology and commercialize it. So as you're thinking about commercializing technologies, often you're overwhelmed with opportunities. So how do we think about where do we start? What's the best place? And the domino strategy, um, uh, first articulated, um, as I know, by Jeffrey Moore in his Crossing the Chasm books about technology commercialization, is he always encourages you to think about a bowling or domino strategy where you have an initial target. Then you look at, based on that initial target, how many additional market segments does it allow you to move into? And the considerations and opportunities for this initial target I'll get to in a few minutes. But one way to think about it then as you're thinking about target markets and market segments is it's not unilateral, there's not just one, and you can think about phasing them over time and how getting into one gets you into another. So to take the physical therapy example again, it could be that the best opportunity is to actually take my physical therapy device and work with physical therapists, independent physical therapy offices, to use it, to prove it, to write some papers, and from there I can then go to two additional markets. I can go to the home use <coughs> market and I can go to the hospital use market. But the barriers to entry to the hospital market for an unproven technology are higher, and to try and go full consumer is too expensive. And so you've got lots of considerations as you're trying to figure out where to take um, your product and commercialize it. So an example of this is I was working with a um, solar company that had a unique technology developed actually by um, uh, DARPA uh, for concentrating solar with very high efficiency. And they were looking at how to differentiate it versus uh, flat array solar panels. And they, we determined that small commercial buildings were one of the best opportunities for um, deploying this, uh, but small commercial buildings that had high energy needs. So we, we looked at that as the first 
uh, entry in terms of time on the bowling pin, once we developed that technology, if we could cost reduce it by coming up a production curve, we could then make it viable from a cost efficiency for parking canopies. Or if we decided uh, to cost reduce it and scale it up with a different technology, with different arrays, we could go to large commercial buildings. So we could take by entry in one market, by taking one technology turn versus a different cost turn, take it into uh, new markets. And so thinking about how your um, first commercialization enables second and third um, as leveraged opportunities is a great way to think about um, market expansion strategy. And then as we thought about reducing the cost into the parking canopy and reducing the size, you could then move into very different kinds of additional markets and it opened up new paths. This is a very, very crowded market that goes to the lowest cost bidder. These are very niche markets that have higher value. If you're looking for a value strategy as a bootstrap startup, which one would you choose? This is bigger, but these are far more profitable. Some of the things to think about as you uh, consider your strategy. The deficiency we see often in the co-motion proposals for first technology commercializations when people come in is they haven't spent enough time talking to their customers. They have an idea and an inspiration based on their technology, based on their research, but going out and talking to the customers and taking it up a level from the your core technology to the problem that the customer is trying to solve, putting it in their ecosystem their context is really important. Um, and so getting into their environment and their other priorities and where your solution fits into that context is a big piece of the early work you need to do as you're trying to validate the market opportunity and your commercialization path for your idea of your technology. And again, I'm gonna go back to understand from the customer's point of view, the use cases and the behavioral issues with incorporating your technology or your commercialized product based on your technology into their work environment, their ecosystem, because it's all about them. Features and benefits is a big piece of this. Uh, it's a great um, conversation. A feature is what our product can do. A lot of companies, especially early stage companies, talk all the time about their features. What investors want to hear and what good marketers do is here is what you can do with our product. Completely turning it on its head. You want to move into the purple space. Um, the user is not the customer. This is another area where we encourage you to think more broadly and more deeply. Um, especially in an industrial or commercial or medical buying environment the user might be the physical therapist or the user might be the, uh, the nurse or the phlebotomist. Uh, the user might be the technician on the semiconductor production line, but they're not the buyer. So what you have to think about as you think about commercializing your product and your technology are the roles in commercial and industrial buying and institutional buying. You need to know what are the needs of the user and whether or not your product is meets those needs within their ecosystem. But you also need to understand what is the role of the buyer, the procurement office, and how much of a gatekeeper are they for this particular product or service? Is this part of a capital budget or an expense budget? If it's a part of a capital budget, uh, what cycle do they renew and make their capital expense planning? Um, I worked in a, a new business development for a particular segment for Hewlett Packard. We went in and looked at the buyer procurement found for capital development in the industry we were looking at. They were on a five to seven year buying cycle. That puts a real crimp in your cash flow projections if it's gonna take five to seven years to sell in your first product. So understanding that's really important. Who are the influencers in that overall decision who are not the users in the buyer procurement? Often they can be uh, in healthcare, uh, particularly GPOs, ACOs, and IDNs, but often in engineering, it's the technical 
it's the design um, or if there are any outcomes-based requirements at a corporate or organizational level. Who are your gatekeepers? Finance, risk management, and insurance people need to be considered as you put together your whole product solution. And then ultimately, who is the one who signs the check? And you need to know exactly who that person is and what their buying criteria are and how they work with the user within your particular target market and target segment and use case. Tools. Lean Canvas is a great one. I know uh, CoMotion encourages all of the early stage businesses coming through uh, idea development and incubation to go into the Lean Canvas. Oops. Well, there used to be something more here, but they have a whole toolkit around Lean Canvas and links on the CoMotion website. Go there and use it. The focus of the Lean Canvas is customer centric, that's its power, and it has you build these boxes. Basically, understanding the problem, working on your solution, understanding your customer segments in a methodical way that really speaks to engineers in particular. So it's, it's a great tool. It's a good match. Go ahead and um, find it and use it. I'm not going to go into it. That's a whole other <laughs> set of uh, classes. I think you offer them here, though. Don't you have lectures on Lean Canvas? Funding. As an angel investor and as a member of the board of Seattle Angel and Seattle Angel Fund, one of the things I know you need to be thinking about as you're thinking about early stage business is what is it that's going to convince funders to invest in your business. What you need to do as you put together your marketing program is create a believer out of the funder. And it is a leap to belief that they have to make so identifying the impact of your invention or your technology that you're commercializing in human terms is really, impro really important when you get to the investor phase of the conversation. So you may have done all that great segmentation, you may have done all the great market growth and sizing, but you need to be able to take it back to the beginning of your pitch to the human terms of how is this going to make a difference for somebody. How is it going to make a difference financially? How is it going to disrupt? And then how is it um, flexible? What's its longevity? What are its opportunities beyond that first market? So market sizing, going a little bit deeper, and I'm looking at the clock, it's like we're almost out of time already, believe it or not. Um, how many of your target market are there and what will they really buy? This is an exercise in modeling. And it's interesting that I've talked to so many of early um, uh, company founders and they get stuck at this phase because they want the right answer. And the answer is there is no right answer. You're modeling possibilities based on qualified assumptions. So as you think about your target market and you think about segmenting, what you're trying to do is find the best available data that can lead to some hypotheses on how to do market sizing. I'm going to skip that one. Does that make sense? So how many are they and what will they buy? But you're modeling it. There's no real answer. As you set your marketing objectives and goals, I've got a checklist that you can use to say my goals are. And Understanding which of these you belong in as you're putting together your marketing strategy is very important. I'm not going to go into it now. It will be available in the notes. So as you do your financial market analysis and you size your market opportunity, first thing you want to understand is your industry structure. And we're going to recommend that you go to any of the UW libraries. But in particular, the business library and the engineering library have great resources about your industry structure and industry analysis. Your UW ID, you can get on there. And there's some great um, CISPs, I think, is one of them. We'll go there in a second. Once you understand the industry structure, you're going to want to go into the size of segments within that industry and then how you reach um, the channels. My recommendations is actually draw a picture. Draw the business. However you understand it, draw a picture and then follow the money. So here's some examples of drawing the business 
for different kinds of markets and different opportunities. Industry structure drawings. These are available from commercial reports. I didn't make these. I pulled them out of reports that would be available through your business library because the industry analysts that cover the different industries do this all the time and they give you insights as to who the competitors are sometimes, who the buyers are, what the value chain process is, um, and all of them are very, very helpful. As you look at these, one of the questions to always ask yourself is who's making money and who's not in this industry? Where is the profit power? And then where am I going to play in a way that I can pull some of that profit power into my business? Because that's what your investors are going to want to see and understand. There's also a great deal of value in value chain drawings. And Porter's book, if you've read um, uh, Michael Porter, uh, has great instructions on how to think about and how to draw value chains. They're underutilized and very, very valuable in understanding um, how value flows in a market. So modeling, getting back to creating a model. I recommend three approaches as you size a market. First one is a tops down approach. And this is the one we almost always see newcomers starting with, and that is a dollar market size and a growth. So the healthcare market is a $400 billion industry and it's growing at 16% per year. And we only need one half of 1% of that $400 billion and we'll be billionaires. Great, it's a place to start, but it is necessary but not sufficient. So then I, what I want you to do is to really show me you understand your target segments and your customers, ooh, I'm in the way, um, by going to unit market size, the percent of the market that you're targeting and the share of units. If you can give me a unit estimation, I know you've gone deep enough in understanding your customer. And if you can give me an average sales price, I know you understand your value proposition and the value you're trying to provide in the marketplace. That's an estimate. There is no correct answer. What I do is, the first thing I do is I compare one and two. And if they're like three orders of magnitude off, I know I've got a lot of work to do. And then I go into a bottoms up demand and production. What can I build? How many could I actually sell? So it could be the unit market size is three million units, but as I ramp up in my first two years with the capital available to me, I can only build 100,000. Well, there's a huge difference between 100,000 at an average sales price versus 20% of a you know, $3 million market. And so what's an appropriate ramp up to achieving your target goal in your market? And that all becomes a model that uh, gives you credibility and helps your investors get to the point where they believe in your, your pitch and your opportunity. So market research is available. Use the industry profiles, market research reports, and news articles that are available through your libraries. Business Source Complete is one of the best resources through the UW libraries. It's a database of business information. As you do your market analysis, SWOT is something you will all be um, introduced to. SWOT is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's a construct for understanding in a competitive marketplace how your strategy will fare. And basically you're looking at internal factors and external factors where you see what your strengths and weaknesses are from what you own and control. External factors are the things beyond your control that will buffet your business and impact it from the outside. They put it in the matrix where you can then put in what are your helpful strengths and harmful and how you're going to respond. And it's a great way to really articulate your understanding of your business within the market. I promised I quickly, and I'm almost a past time, so I, I quickly go through which market first, considerations for which market first in that diagram where you're building on your markets. Really important to your investors is time to first revenue, your ability to generate cash flow should be your first consideration as you decide which markets you want to go into, unless you yourself have deep pockets or you're planning to bootstrap. But if you're looking to get investors, angel investors or venture capital investors, 
they're going to want to see a path to cash flow. So you've got to look at that time to first revenue. Um, does the buyer have money? Can the sales force reach them? And what's the sales cycle time? Understanding those will prioritize a market before some of the other opportunities. Do you have a compelling whole product solution? Can you meet the need in the customer's environment in their ecosystem? So not just your technology, but everything else that has to go with that technology to change their process and their behaviors. What's the level of competition? How good are they and how entrenched are they? Are you trying to push out somebody who's deeply entrenched into an industry? Um, uh, IT and healthcare is one where there's one company that seems to own all the healthcare uh, insurance processing and is deeply entwined uh, with tentacles into all the IT systems. If you're going to try and go in and replace them in a two-year time frame, that's a whole lot harder than taking a niche piece, pulling it off, and um, trying that per strategy. Leverageability, how can you take that investment and learning from this segment into a next one? Where are there the regulatory hurdles? And what's the profitability? You want to enter your more profitable markets first, your higher price markets first, and it's always easier to drop price later than to have differentiated price for an equivalent product in two different markets. So, oh, there we go. Last one. Leave the room with impact. As you're doing a pitch for an investor, for a new business startup, and you're talking about your market and your customers, what you need to do is focus on why the listener, the investor, should care. So I encourage you to go through the train of thought of so what. We have a novel genomic sequencing algorithm. OK, I'm an investor. I'm a business person. I don't know anything from genomic sequencing. So what? Well, it's going to allow us to sequence full genomes twice as fast. OK, good. Fast is good. Tell me more. So what? Well, it's going to enable doctors to sequence patients before choosing therapies. OK, what does that allow? Well, that's allowing for customized therapeutic plans based on DNA. OK, good. So. Patients will get healthier faster and insurance companies will save millions on wasted therapies. Now we're getting to something an investor can get excited about, really believe in, and the human piece at the end, families will be grateful and the healthcare system is going to work better. So you want to end on a human or system level. But you need to take from your technology, your core idea, all the way through this process to a level and an investor will understand what it is and what the impact of your opportunity is. Questions? Marketing in 20 minutes, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And often this is where marketing tools come into play. And so um, an example of this is when I worked at Hewlett Packard um, and we were trying to increase the adoption of uh, work group laser printers in the late 90s. So when it used to be that instead of each work group having a laser printer uh, that was shared by 10 to 20 people, You'd have the big, huge IBM printer down at the end of the hall and at the end of the building, and everybody would have to send everything to a print shop. We had a technology that made it very affordable, local, and um, efficient, but the buyers did not see the cost benefit of the local workstation printer versus the IBM solution <laughs> at the end of the hall. And we had to create a whole set of tools and models that our salespeople could use to actually input that specific IT buyer's data in terms of number of users, number of printouts, and cost per page to get a total cost of ownership based on their use model. And as soon as we gave our sales guys that tool, it broke open that barrier. Is that 
What? Jet Direct. Jet Direct was part of the solution, yes. Does that answer your question? Exactly. So what you want to do is keep your eye on the end customer. And I had this little side thing at the very first slide that I'll go back to. Um, with appropriate and aligned incentives throughout the distribution system. And I glossed over that, but that's what you're speaking to. When you think about anyone in your channel or in your distribution system who is getting paid to help you reach the end customer and the end user, you need to make sure you're thinking about aligned incentives so that they have incentives similar to what you do in terms of what you're trying to do as a solution for the consumer. Because where you end up with problems is when you have misaligned incentives or you have profit and power <coughs> struggles with your channel. <coughs> and there's a lot of work that can be done in marketing and there's specialists who uh, this is all that they do is aligned, but that's a, a big piece of it. So. For example, uh, going to consumer products, since you mentioned consumer products, um, had a real interesting challenge with this very early on in my career. I was brand manager for Kingsford Charcoal. So barbecue, barbecue season. We all love to barbecue. Well, barbecue is a really interesting um, issue with the grocery store chain because it's huge. The volume of a bag of charcoal is big. Second, it's dirty. They don't like bringing in charcoal into the clean grocery area because sometimes the bags do leak little bits of brown flecks. And third is it's seasonal. It's really hard to uh, sell it between, you know, any time between September and the next March. Um, nobody's buying charcoal. And so we had to work really hard on our channel programs. Um, and we would always start off barbecue season, for example, depending on which geography, and it differed by whether you were in New England in the Northeast and the Midwest or whether you were Texas in the Southeast, what month. But we would actually have huge incentive programs to pay the stores to bring in a pallet of charcoal the first week of barbecue season. And we would have a whole program around the opening of barbecue season to try and incent the channel to do what we wanted them to do, which would be to stock in earlier and create a pre-Memorial Day uh, consumption opportunity. Because we found if we could get pre-Memorial Day consumption of, of barbecue, you would actually see more barbecue for the whole rest of the summer. Because once people got the grill out and got it cleaned, the barrier for their behavioral use was lower. And since we understood the customer behavior and the user, we just had to work with our channel partners to make sure we could deliver on it. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a real challenge, and what you have to do is look at the behaviors of early adopters, especially if you're looking at any kind of technology adoption. Um, there's some really good insights in a whole bunch of different books. One of them is Crossing the Chasm, looking at what technology adoption looks like, what the barriers to technology adoption are, what is the psychographic profile of people who are more likely to take the risk with a new product, and then how to take those people who took the risk and turn them into evangelicals for your product. Because that's, if you're really creating a new category, that's what it takes um, for adoption um, in consumer markets. In professional markets, often it's seeding it with key thought leaders. How do you, how do you find specific thought leaders who can seed the market by having them write white papers about the use of your product and how it changed whatever it is they were trying to accomplish, um, or how do you bring them in as advisors? So if you're in a very niche niche, you know, a specific kind of micro heart surgery, and there's two heart surgeons who are the lead guys in this, if you could get one of them to be an early adopter and write a paper 
about whatever it is you're offering. That's a huge opportunity um, to move forward, but it really takes a product that's completely aligned with what that heart surgeon is trying to accomplish and often working in partnership with that person to even do the final phases of development. And so if you're in early development and you're in that kind of a niche market, the thing to do is to find somebody to put on your advisory board who you're going to pay to help develop that product because then they will become uh, a lead uh, evangelist for you. Yeah? It can be approached by the inventors themselves, or they can hire to do it. What I recommend um, for my inventors who are fairly early on and haven't gotten to putting together their team yet is I ask them to set aside four hours a week to work on just their marketing. And it's really hard because they don't want to do that. They want to work 80 hours a week on their invention and the commercialization. And I say take four hours a week and spend that time doing the research, start putting together the map, work through these tools, work for your lead. And if you spend four hours a week, one-tenth of your week, a nominal week, it's one-fifth of a real work week for somebody working in a startup, you'll find you can make significant progress on it, but you have to be disciplined about doing it and doing it regularly, and you can start putting together the pieces of the puzzle. You won't have it comprehensive, but you'll have a plausible place to start so then when you start building your team you can now articulate with somebody outside of your technology and outside of uh, your specialty what it is that the opportunity is and they'll be able to be much more effective and especially cost effective in helping you then develop that further and I think we've seen that a lot with um, the commercialization teams where we've gotten the CGAs the graduate assistants to come work with the principal investigators and the more the principal investigator has thought about it, his or her market and can articulate pieces, then the graduate student who has volunteered to come in and help do some of that work is much, much more effective. You bet.
testing when people are texting. Oh, okay. Great. Um, sounds good. So everything that you see right now is being recorded and online. Perfect. <laughs> um, if you want to change it, you can just hit play. And yeah, it's good to go. Yeah. And we'll start on the second one, so when you're ready. This is the new button right here. Yeah. Okay. Everyone just can't see it on cuz it's so hard to read. Should we adjust the video? Did you want to ask her about the PowerPoint? Oh, yeah. Since she's trying it up right now. And you got Yeah, she's gonna mention something about maybe the second PowerPoint being more creative. No, I didn't mention that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay great. Yeah, yeah. Was it this one? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Just the rev- she wasn't sure if it was the revised one. There was one that you had sent that made sure you had corrected it, but you didn't ta- give it to Tom. Oh, no, it was part of the link. Oh, okay. So, I don't know if you wanna go through it, but Yeah, we can tell if it's the right one, just to The old one. This is the old one? Yeah. But we can just delete that. If it's easier, we can really just delete that Yeah. Yeah. one and just redo it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you wanna do. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever you wanna do. Yeah. [noise] It's fine. Yeah. Which one is it? It's number six, we're just not doing it without one. [noise] No, it's okay. Yeah. Oh. Cuz we have to get that out. Yeah. Um, do you wanna change that one? Oh yeah, and change that one over. Yeah. [noise] Then we know for sure when the other ones are gonna be easier. Yeah. [laughs] But everything else is like [noise] Okay. Perfect. So far so good. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Then we just need to figure out for the next one. Perfect. [noise] And then you guys should have a click here to go. Cuz it's right there. Yeah. All right. Footsie is already here. Yeah, I'm gonna sit down. [noise] She's so excited. [noise] You can sit right over there. She's so excited. Here, baby. Come here. Can you sit? You can't sit. [inaudible 1:55:03.25] Yeah, just click right over there. Thanks, babe. Um, can you take this off? Yeah, it's off. Yeah, just take it off. I was just gonna sit on the floor. Well, you can sit on the floor. Do we wanna sit on the floor? No, we'll go sit over there. Okay. Would you mind getting me some more tea? We'll enter the living room portion of Mm? Can you get me some more tea, please? Sure. Actually, could I have a little half top up, too? Since you are being so helpful. Since you've been volunteered, volunteed. Yeah. I will, I will do as I am voluntold. Thank you. Girls do love ordering men around, it is kind of fun. I just love ordering everybody around, I don't care. [laughs] I can make more, too. Gender. Yeah, I probably do, too. That's true. [noise] Oh, this is cute. That's like a little side table to me. But, um, that's not for sure. Mhm. Well, that's what the future holds for you, Nattie. So, yeah, um, I was just gonna chat with her. Um, we have our um, a new um, uh, speaker wherever she is in the Whitley room. Oh. And so she's gonna be speaking and cooking for us all. Yes! [noise] I thought you, I thought you were gonna say that. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Well, we're doing business connections a lot on the Knot website, so she's gonna be talking to us about that. Yeah, and plus, like, um, as with any business, like, you have to kind of plan and prepare for it. Like, right now, it's a little bit busy, but that's okay. Yeah. That's totally fine. Yeah. Cool. We have our tea. There's another cup here for me, too. Um, I'm okay with that. I don't care about the caffeine. Oh, no, I have tea. Yes, please. Okay. Um, but you are going to be talking about the steak issue and the dining issues. And the menu and how to order it. Mhm. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'll be discussing that with you later. Okay. [laughs] Yeah, we'll be able to dive into that. Oh, that's great. There's dessert, I mean, there's dessert on the way, too. What time are you guys close to finishing dinner? Mhm. Yeah, me neither. Mhm. I'm just gonna snack all the dessert and half it off. Oh, yeah. There's dessert, yeah. Like, there's dessert on the way, too. What time are you guys done? Dinner time probably. So, probably around dinner time. Mhm. Would you like to sit across from, Mike and I can sit on the inside. You guys can sit on the outside. [inaudible 1:59:46.83] Huh? Why would you do that? [laughs] Mm, I think we're better off outside. Yeah. Let's go to the dining room. Mhm. Oh, okay. So the four factors that you wanna consider when you're selecting an entity: first, you have formation and maintenance requirements. Mhm. [noise] Funding. What type of funding do you want for your business? Uh, how your business is going to be treated for tax purposes. And finally, whether or not you'll be personally liable for your business's debts and obligations. Now we're gonna go through each one of those factors in a little bit more detail next. So, with formation and maintenance, the first thing you wanna ask is how much is it going to cost me to actually form my entity in the first place? Because certain entities will have filing fees, um, and then also how much is it going to cost to maintain it? Whether you have to keep filing these documents, um, all that can cost money. Uh, next you wanna ask, it's kind of similar but what steps do I actually have to take in order to form and maintain? So, when you're filing all these documents, you're going to be paying money to file them. Um, whether you have to pay someone to create these documents for you, um, is going to be an issue. And then finally, you have what state should I be forming my entity in? So, a business can incorporate in any state. And most businesses will incorporate in the state where they do a majority of their business and where they're physically located. So, for the purposes of our presentation today, we're gonna be focusing on Washington law, with the assumption that most of you are thinking about starting your business here in Washington state. Um, but it is important to note that if your business, uh, if you're planning on doing business in multiple states or you're planning on seeking funding from institutional investors or maybe going public in the future, a lot of companies will consider incorporating in the state of Delaware. And you might be thinking, why Delaware? Well, Delaware has a very well-settled body of corporate law, and the corporate law is very favorable to business owners. So, 
a lot of institutional investors want their businesses to be incorporated there, and a lot of the big public companies that you're familiar with are incorporated in Delaware. Um, but that's definitely just something to keep in mind, even though we are talking about Washington law, if you incorporate in Washington first and then you want to later reincorporate in Delaware or another state, it's relatively easy to do, so it's something if your business grows, you can think about doing that. So the next factor is funding, and there are going to be four main places where you're going to be seeking funding. First, yourself. <laughs> Second, friends or family. Third, institutional investors. And finally, if you're doing something for a charitable purpose, maybe fundraising. Third factor is tax treatment. So um, depending on what type of entity you pick, your business is going to be treated differently for tax purposes. Um, there are two main types of tax treatment. So you have double taxation and pass-through. So in double taxation, the business is going to be first taxed at the corporate level. And so that'll be taxed at corporate rates. And then it's also taxed again a second time when the profits are distributed to shareholders. So you're taxed twice. With pass-through, the business is only taxed once. So the income passes through the business and is taxed to the owner at their individual rates. So we're not going to get into much detail about the tax consequences because it's really complicated, but the takeaway here is that most people prefer the pass-through, right, because they're only getting taxed once. So that's definitely a big benefit. You're going to save more money. Okay, and the <coughs> final factor is personal liability. So um, different entities will, be, will provide a business owner with limited liability. And this protection is referred to as the corporate veil. So you can see, so you have your personal assets and then your business and the creditors are all on the outside. So this means that when a business is sued, that the owner won't be personally responsible for the business's debts and obligations. So if you're sued, then only the assets of your business are at risk and they're not going to come after your home, your car, everything in your bank account. However, it's really important to remember that certain entities have what we call corporate formalities that you have to follow. And if you don't follow them, that corporate veil can be pierced. So we call it piercing the corporate veil. Um, and corporate formalities range depending on the type of entity, but they can be, you know, like holding like organizational meetings, adopting bylaws, making sure people are actually following your bylaws, or like when you have meetings, maintaining really detailed minutes, you know, like making sure you write down every important decision that's made. Um, we'll talk more about the corporate formalities later. Crystal will touch on that. But, um, if you don't follow those, then even if your entity has limited liability, the courts can say, okay, we're going to ignore that and we're going to hold you personally liable. So it's really important to do that. Okay, so now off to Crystal we'll talk about the different types of entities. Question. Um, it's generally it is the same, but today we're like we're mostly talking about Washington law. But yeah, regardless of where you're forming, if you're not actually following these formalities, the courts can pierce the corporate veil. Um, I think Delaware has a little bit of a different law when it comes yeah. to um, personal liability. Um, I'm not quite sure of the details, but I actually think that Delaware more friendly is more friendly than um, other states are. Yeah, yeah just generally. I think that's right. Um, so now that we've discussed the factors that you consider when you're selecting your type of entity, we're going to go through the different types of entities. Um, and today we're going to talk about, ooh, I hit the wrong button. Today we're going to talk about um, five different types of entities. So the first is a sole proprietorship. Um, the second is a general partnership. And a corporation, which has two different types of corporations, a C Corp and an S Corp. Um, a limited liability company and a nonprofit corporation. So a sole proprietorship um, is basically a business with one owner and they don't have to file any papers with the state. Um, they basically just operate, open and operate for business. Um, so then the pros and cons of each, um, we're gonna go through the pros and cons of each entity. So some of the pros of a sole proprietorship is that there's no formal formation requirements or ongoing maintenance requirements generally. Um, so basically, if you open up your business and start doing something, you are acting as a sole proprietorship, no matter if you've registered with the state or done anything. Um, another pro of a sole proprietorship is that it's not um, subject to double taxation. Um, so as Ashley mentioned, it's only going to be taxed once at the individual's rate. 
Um, some of the cons of a sole proprietorship is that investors are probably not going to choose to fund you um, and that you do not have personal liability. So that's probably the biggest con of just operating a sole proprietorship because a lot of people would say, oh, that seems easy. Um, oh, you, do. You, you have personal oh, yeah, sorry. You do have personal liability. Did I say you do not? Yeah. Oh, you do have personal liability. Sorry about that. Um, and so a lot of people will say, well, it's, if it's so easy to form a sole proprietorship, I should just operate as that. But if you're doing anything where you're interacting with, you know, people that could put you in a situation to be potentially liable um, to third parties, then you generally want a type of entity that's going to protect you a little bit from that. Um, and so your personal assets can't be touched. But in the case of a sole proprietorship, there's no corporate veil. Uh, and so the next entity is a general partnership, and this is pretty similar to a sole proprietorship, um, but this one is just two individuals um, acting together, um, forming a business for profit. Um, so instead of just one person, it would be, you know, Ashley and I starting a business together, then we would be general partners if we are holding ourselves out as partners. Uh, so some of the pros, well, actually, generally the pros and cons of a general partnership are the same as as sole proprietorship because they're basically the same type of entity just with one person versus two people. Um, so again, there's no formal formation or maintenance requirements, although you can have a partnership agreement in a partnership. So two partners can elect to sign an agreement that details, um, you know, Ashley's gonna do, run the day-to-day -day business and I'm gonna, you know, sit more back and, and maybe just fund it. So you can, you can work something out like that, but it's not required. Um, similarly, there's no double taxation, no investor funding, and you want to make sure I say it right, you do have personal liability. And so now we're going to move on to corporations, and like I said, there are two types of corporations. And so what sets corporations apart in general from other businesses is that they're an independent legal and tax entity, and they're separate from the people who own and operate the business. Um, <coughs> And so first we're going to talk about C-Corps. And some of the pros of a C-Corp are that they are very attractive to investors. So investors are generally attracted to the prospect of having higher dividends. And so or owners of a corporation can hold different types of stock, um, preferred stock and common stock. And uh, generally investors are going to want preferred stock because preferred stock gives them higher dividends um, when the corporation gives out money. So uh, generally, they want the preferred stock because they want higher dividends. Um, and also, a corporation provides for limited liabilities, so the owner's personal assets are protected by the corporate veil, provided that you follow the corporate formalities that are going to be detailed over here. So some of the cons of a corporation, a C-Corp, is that the formation, the formation and maintenance requirements are um, a little extensive and can be costly. And so basically to form a corporation, a C-Corp, you have to file an Articles of Incorporation, you have to do an organizational meeting, um, elect directors, create bylaws, and then there's also filing fees, um, which the sheet that we've handed out to you details the filing fees um, of the major types of entities in Washington. So, and generally these filing fees are, are more expensive in, in Delaware. I think they're more definitely more expensive in Delaware and it just varies based on states. Um, and then to maintain, you have to do the corporate formalities which include you know, having separate bank accounts for your personal life and your business life. So if you commingle those funds, that's one of the main issues, that's one of the main reasons why the corporate veil is, is pierced because um, owners are commingling their funds together and intermixing uh, personal funds and business funds, and then basically the court says, well, how are individuals supposed to know that you're a business with limited liability if you're just acting as a regular person and putting all of your money in the same account? How are they supposed to know that you're a business? Um, and then lastly, I don't know if that's lastly, but another con is that a, a corporation, a C corporation is double taxed. So it's going to be taxed, first the business is going to pay the taxes, and it's important to note that at the, at the first level, um, the corporate taxation level, it's, it's the business who's paying the taxes um, out of the profits. And then when it's distributed, when it distributes to the shareholders, the shareholders are then paying those taxes. So it's not as though the business is paying both taxes, but 
you're still having less profits at the end of the day. Um, and lastly, it is once you elect to be a C Corp, it's uh, generally pretty difficult to change to a different type of entity, such as a limited liability company or whatnot. So you want to be pretty sure that you want to be a C Corp when you form a C Corp. Um, and this is the second type of corporation, which is an S Corp. And the main difference between an S Corp and a C Corp is that an S Corp has additional requirements that have to be met uh, in order to form an S Corp. Um, and those are, uh, they can only have a max of 100 shareholders and that they can only have one type of stock. So as a C Corp can have both preferred stock and common stock, um, an S Corp can only have common stock. So some of the pros of an S Corp are passed through taxation. So unlike corporation, or unlike C Corps, uh, S Corps are taxed only once when the dividends are distributed to the shareholders. Um, and similarly, they have limited liability as long as the corporate formalities are followed. And the same cons as a C Corp in that their maintenance and formation requirements are extensive because they require the same exact things, um, except for in addition, <laughs> Uh, S-Corps also have those specific requirements that have to be met. And because they have these specific requirements, it also makes them really unattractive to investors. Um, because like I said before, investors want those higher dividends, so they want to be able to have you know, the preferred stock, and a, an S-Corp can't provide them with preferred stock. Um, and also uh, having a max of 100 shareholders is pretty restrictive. And so once your business starts to grow, um, you may want to, you know, have stock options for employees or, you know, just go, you could even want to go public or something like that. And having a restriction of 100 shareholders is, it sometimes cannot be good. Um, and also because of those factors, because of those additional requirements, it's really easy to lose your S Corp status without even realizing that you're doing it. Um, so you have to be pretty diligent and make sure that you are meeting these requirements or else they will just say that you're a C Corp because that's how you're operating and you're d you don't meet the requirements of an S Corp. And just as a C Corp, it's really difficult to change um, from an S Corp to a different type of entity like an LLC once you've elected to be an S Corp. One way, I think, I know one way is easier than the other because it's just a matter of I think that going from a C Corp So the next uh, entity that we're going to be talking about is a limited liability company. Um, and so the main difference between a corporation and an LLC is that corporations have sort of this set management structure um, where the directors oversee you know, the business decisions and then um, the officers are responsible for running the day-to-day -day business activities. And so LLCs don't have this same set management structure. Um, an LLC can, can decide how it wants to be managed. So it can decide that it wants to be member managed, which 
in an LLC, the members, uh, they call them the members, but they're the owners. And so it can decide that it wants to be member managed and basically manage itself, or it can decide that it wants to be manager managed. And manager managed just means they elect managers who manage the, the corporate, or who manage the company. So um, that sort of flexibility um, leads us to one of our big pros is that it's really flexible and that you can decide how you want your business to be run. So you're not um, you know, restricted by any of these. You have to have you know, directors and so on. Um, and so a limited liability company offers, you can elect to be either double tax or pass through. And so that's, I mean, if you're considering between you know, what are the benefits, the costs and benefits, you can choose either. And I think you can change um, which one you decide. Like if you decide to be pass through first, then you can change it to double tax if you later think that that's better for your, your company. Um, also limited liability companies, as it says in the name, offer limited liability. And so similar to corporations, as long as the corporate formalities, which are slightly different um, for an LLC, are followed, then you're going to get your limited liability. And um, there are fewer formation and maintenance requirements than a corporation for an LLC. Um, basically, um, basically, you have to file a certificate of formation, which is very similar to an Articles of Incorporation, but that's really the only thing that you have to do, that you're required to do. Um, you can have what's called an operating agreement, which is really similar to bylaws, um, which you know sets out the management structure, whether you want it to be manager managed or member managed, um, and all that sort of thing. You can elect directors if you want. You can do all these things if you want to, but the point is that you don't have to. Um, so the only thing you have to do is file the one um, certificate of formation, and, and that's it. And so as corporations are hard to change from you know, a corporation to an LLC, um, it's easier to change from an LLC to a corporation if you later decide that that's a better entity for you. And the main con of a, an LLC is that you're going to get less investor funding. And so basically, venture capital firms, um, they don't want their taxes they have a lot of um, tax exempt and, and foreign people, um, foreign individuals uh, in their uh, firms. And so they don't want those taxes to be passed through. Um, and because if you're tax exempt, you don't necessarily have to file. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated tax thing that I, um, I'm probably not qualified to get into. But if Laura has anything um, to well, share. Thank you. 
And the last type of entity we're going to talk about is a nonprofit corporation. So up until now, we've been talking about for-profit entities. Um, and so basically, the difference is um, this is operated not for profit. And so uh, a nonprofit corporation uh, is basically a corporation that's formed to carry out some sort of charitable, uh, educational, religious, literary, scientific, um, you know, it's a laundry list of, of, of things, but basically a charitable purpose. Um, and what a nonprofit can do is it can fundraise, and that's usually how it gets its, its money. And so it can get money from individuals, from grants, from companies, from all sorts of people. And the benefit of, of being a nonprofit is that generally you can apply to, to federal and state um, governments and be exempt from taxes. And so um, basically they do this because of the benefits that an, a nonprofit corporation gives to society. So in, in return, they don't tax them. But um, in Washington, put this up there. So you can obtain, this should say federal and state tax of the exemptions, but um, in Washington, it's sort of, it, I mean, we don't have state income taxes, so there's not really much for a, a nonprofit corporation to be exempt from. And just by, it's, I should point out, just by forming a nonprofit does not mean that you automatically receive these tax exemptions. You have to apply for them. And so a 501c3 is, is one of the most popular uh, federal tax exemptions. And so, um, but since Washington doesn't have state income tax, uh, there's nothing to be exempt from. So nonprofits actually pay the same taxes generally as a regular business. Um, <coughs> and so, like I said, the most common is for federal is a 501c3 status. And what happens is that nonprofits aren't taxed on their income and also donors who donate to the nonprofits can can write off on their taxes the donations. And so that that makes it more attractive for people to donate to your nonprofit if you can say that you have five oh one C three status and that they can write off their um, donations to you. Um, so a nonprofit also provides for a limited liability um, as long as the corporate formalities are followed and the corporate formalities are similar um, to what a regular corporation is and that it has to file an articles of incorporation, bylaws, organizational meeting, um, all those fees and whatnot. Um, but like I said, in order to get the federal tax exemption, you have to apply for 501c3 and fill out this IRS form. And basically the form is really long and you have to provide them with a lot of information and it can be pretty confusing for you know regular people to fill out. Um, and so that's part of a con, it, it, it takes a lot to form and also to maintain, so you have to continue, um, you have to fill out, it's like an annual report, um, and so you have to continue to file those every year telling the federal government, you know, certain types of things about where your money's going <coughs> and whatnot. And also, additionally, nonprofits, if, if you are under the federal ex tax exemption, also require, they restrict you in various ways and that, you know, you can't use your funds to do a lot of political things, a lot of lobbying. Um, you know, you have to comply with public disclosure requirements. Um, you have to properly document all the money you're receiving from donations. And so it's just a lot of administrative burden to perform a nonprofit and to maintain a nonprofit. Um, so it just takes a lot. And um, yeah. And another con is that obviously it's a limited purpose. So not a lot of organizations can meet the, the limited purpose. And so that makes it difficult as well. Okay, so I'm gonna finish us off here with just some general business requirements. So these are requirements that will apply to your business regardless of what type of entity. So all those different five entities we talked about, this would still apply to you. Um, first, you're going to need to obtain an EIN. So this is just a number that the IRS gives you in order for them to track uh, the tax returns and the, the tax consequences that you have as an employer. Um, that's just a form you would fill out. And then second, you're going to have to apply for business licenses and get your UBI number. Um, the UBI is the number that you get when you apply for the license. And in Washington, it's a really low threshold for when you're going to need a license. So as you can see here, if you're grossing more than 12,000, doing business in any name other than your own, hiring employees or selling a product or service. So pretty much if you're doing any sort of 
business, you're going to have to get a business license in order to be in Washington State. And finally, it's just important to remember, depending on the type of business that you have, there might be specific licenses that are required for that. So for example, like let's say you're starting a moving company, there might be licenses specifically surrounding that because you're going into people's homes and you're moving people's property. Um, and so it depends on the type of business, so you should definitely look into that. And also, not only do they have business licenses at the state level, but they also exist at the city and the county level. So you have to check all over the place, you know, like what city you're in and county and state and get licenses through all of those organizations. And that's it. So now we'll take questions. <laughs> Go ahead. So I am personally not <laughs> extremely well versed in nonprofits. Um, I generally only know about 501c3s because it's the most popular um, exemption that's sought. I don't know if Laura ha knows anything about other. Okay. Yeah. Is there, I don't know if you know this, but um, to file the EZ, I mean, is there like a threshold that between being able to file an EZ and having yeah, to file the, the yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, there, if you go on to the Washington, I think, Secretary of State website, you can see the requirements for what kind of information you'll need to apply for a license. But recalling from my memory, I'm pretty sure you need a, a business address. It's a lot of... I think you do. Yeah. Um, I know right? definitely um, if you file an Articles of Incorporation, you're going to have to have an address and, yeah. you know, like a, a registered agent who represents, you know... A lot of... It, yeah. yeah. So it just depends. But I, I'm pretty sure for a business license, you have to have an address, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask Laura what would be the typical fee to do for the LLC or corporation. Sorry, what, I, what would be a typical yeah. fee for a lawyer uh, to move an LLC <laughs> to a, a C Corp? What sort of dollars are you talking about? Well, I, you know, I work for a CRF so I don't know uh, the particulars. And a conversion statute was recently adopted that sort of eases process. But it's so That one might be another one for Laura. Yeah, international, I yeah, I don't know. I mean, the statutes, <laughs> that sounds like a typical lawyer, but the statutes seem like sometimes might have something laid out where um, there might be certain requirements if there's a foreign partner or something like that. Um, I'm not quite sure, but the Secretary of State website is always great, um, helpful information for, for requirements of forming a business. Well, thank you both so much. We really appreciate it.